Welcome everybody back here on Siegel Talks. It's a Monday morning in New York City in Manhattan and uh, we had the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Grady Center CUNY in Midtown and the City University and um, it's uh, uh, in the middle of July. These were hot and humid days um, in New York and the city is a little bit a shell of itself. Uh, stores are closed, barricaded. Uh, you can see moving vans where furniture is being removed from restaurants, stores for rent signs are up. People are sitting outside on the streets and just at the size of the restaurants and trying to enjoy uh, a meal when it rains, which it did uh, sometimes over the weekend. They eat and continue to eat with big umbrellas and uh, try to, to, to capture a little bit of that New York spirit we miss so uh, terribly. There are good news uh, in that sense for New York City when it comes to um, the coronavirus. Yesterday was the very first day without a death, a corona death uh, in the city. It uh, used to be um, over 500 uh, on some days. And um, as far as we know, there are 25,000 uh, uh, casualties, people, really people who died, 25,000. It's uh, an incredible number, 200. 20,000 infections we know about, but there are so many, many more uh, as the Times reported in the Corona neighborhood in Queens. And yes, it is called Corona neighborhood. 68% of the population has antibodies. So uh, we don't really know how many were infected, how many not the disadvantaged, the disenfranchised, the marginal uh, communities have been hit harder. And uh, the big fear is it will come to the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side, and those numbers might be then the same there. And so we do not know, but at least New York is doing something good, not the US in itself. It had over 60,000 infections, again, a record, record number. Uh, 900 people died uh, uh, yesterday um, altogether. Um, Florida alone had 15,000 infections in uh, one day. It's the record. No state ever has had such high cases. Disney World is opening amidst that disaster. We don't really know um, what the ideas are behind this. 39 states of, out of the over 50 actually have uh, surging numbers. So it's a, it is still a devastating. Uh, Latin America is now the number two after uh, the United States. Um, when it comes uh, to, to, to casualties, uh, they are even uh, ahead of dead people now. It's uh, one, 145,000, slightly more than the US. Europe has 200,000. So it's, uh, uh, it's still um, a time of a great, great concern. 13 million cases worldwide, 7 million have been recovered, 580,000, 600,000 deaths, as far as we know. And US with 3.3 million infections is the big leader and Brazil at next is 1.9 million. The United Kingdom per 100 people actually is the very, very highest followed by Spain, Italy, and then the US. Actually, the UK has the double amount of infections than the US at the moment. Of course, it's smaller, it's spreading faster, but these are numbers perhaps we all are uh, looking at. Um, Israel is reinforcing a complete lockdown there after it looked like everything went so well. It's a scary moment. Uh, Hong Kong is closing everything. Gyms, theaters, movies, all they open up again. Every group meeting with more than four people is now officially no longer allowed. And, um, and so it's a quite a complicated time. There are fears though. World Children's Organization that over 10 million children will never go back to school because of coronavirus. It's a big hit uh, against that progress because worldwide numbers were up of children going to school, women uh, getting educations, but this is um, endangered. And um, we at the City University also are joining, I think, a lawsuit with 17 other states against the Trump administration who recklessly uh, tries to uh, revoke visas for foreign students. It's a, a, a bad idea, a terrible idea of an administration that has shown no leadership and the reasons why numbers are so bad in the US, of course, are only uh, because of uh, uh, incompetent uh, uh, leadership that most probably has many, many lives on their conscience. And uh, it's a, a shocking. Trump yesterday was photographed for the first time with a mask, uh, still they, uh, do not fully enforce it. It's a, a denial of reality as in so many other things and it shouldn't be politicized right now. If you wear a mask, you are against Trump. 
You don't wear a mask. You're for Trump. It should not be like this. It's reckless. It's dangerous and shocking for a nation like the United States. And we all hope that things uh, will change. Um, artists, as we have done in our talks uh, here, Global Talk in the Siegel Center, have been always close to um, the social progress, to the complex fight for freedom and liberties. And they are in the present. They see the present closer than we do, and they anticipate um, the future. And uh, with us today, we have um, uh, one of the great uh, New York artists and the great New York companies. It's Ping Chong from his great Ping Chong uh, company. And um, he uh, is a pioneer of many, many, many works. Started out with Meredith Monk in the very beginning. And he's a theater director, choreographer, video installation artist, and a pioneer in the use of media in theater when it was not yet as fashionable, someone like a John Jesseron, uh, Ping Chong's theatrical work brings unique artistic vision and he deals with historical major issues of our times and brings unheard voices and unrepresented and underrepresented stories um, to the stage. Um, whether it's the hidden genocide in Africa, modernization in China, the experience of Muslim use of the United States after 9-11 or many, many others, he has created over 100 productions since 1972 and everybody who works in theater really knows what that means. He has two OB awards, two Bessie awards, and he received from President Obama, who was a great president. Looking back, if we see that now, he received the National Medal for the Arts. Um, we will uh, see a video work from him also at the very end um, of uh, Siegel Talks, uh, work he created about this uh, time here, and we will talk about it. So uh, Ping Chong, I want to apologize for my long introduction, and I'm going to shut up now. This is all about listening, and people might say, what is that? You know, he talks all the time, but he says he's listening. So this is it for me. So Ping Chong, uh, first of all, thanks for joining. You're welcome. Where are you? Where are you? I'm in uh, New York City, uh, next to the headquarters of the New York City Police. Where, where so is that? I'm in, I'm, so I'm in the heart of the of the protest area for the last couple of weeks. Oh, so it's, it's right by the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, downtown Manhattan. So it's Chinatown officially. Uh, uh, it's it's on the border. It's the border of Chinatown and whatever they call below that. I don't know what they call the city hall. I guess. Yeah, I know you, you were born in Canada, but when you were four months old, you came here um, to New York City. So you are one of the very few real New Yorkers. How was that experience for you of the corona? Uh, well, I think like everybody else, it was a shock when it first started. I mean, I remember, I remember um, the Thursday night that everything, all the shows shut down because I was actually going to go to here to see a production at here and then of course it was canceled it was also the brooklyn museum was about to open an exhibition i think about studio 54 yeah you know which yeah. is really uh, <laughs> peculiar to think about at this point so all of that was happening um at the top of the of the closing of everything and uh, of course i like everybody else didn't know uh, what was safe and what wasn't safe. And I, I think that like everybody else in the early part of this, it was very scary, you know. And then as uh, time went on, it was, uh, it was interesting in that the isolation and the lockdown was uh, an opportunity to do things that I didn't have time to do uh, before the lockdown, because that limited uh, what you could do. And, uh, but I think the thing that's interesting about this time for me is that um, things change in, in an interesting way. I mean, I, I found, um, um, I, think, I think one of the, one, one of the questions someone recently asked me was, so how, is it, how is it to make art in this time or is it, what's it like? And I said, well, it's like any time, making art is, making art you know and certainly it's true that in theater we actually had to postpone a show we were going to open in april but then that uh, changed into something we wound up um, doing on on the internet instead but the idea of making art for me anyway because i mean i'm fortunate in the sense that 
I'm not, I don't think of myself as a theater artist, even though I've spent um, 48 years in the theater. I think of myself as an artist in the theater, as opposed to being a theater artist, um, because my interests are um, beyond that too. I mean, I, I, I choreograph when I have the opportunity. I like, I, like you said, I, I do installations and, and uh, for my personal, uh, because um, I've been working so long, I'm also um, writing um, memoir related things. Um, and right now, the, the, when this lockdown started, I said, well, great, this is an opportunity for me to work on a very, very long essay about all the works that I wanted to do that I didn't get to do. The many projects that uh, either failed or were shut down or didn't get done for whatever reason. So I'm writing this very long essay about um, those projects. And at first I, I thought, well, I have about 10 projects, but actually it's turning into many more projects than I realized as, as my memory started to open up and I started to remember. But I think the other thing is that, you know, I know a lot of people have had a very hard time with the shutdown, um, but um, I think that one thing about artists is that we, we spend a lot of time with our inner lives because everything we, we create comes out of our internal uh, being. And that's something that um, I think about right now because this um, contemporary urban society, this consumerist world that we live in really um, manipulates our ability to um, hear our inner selves. It's everything is designed to keep us from having an inner life, which is your true life, you know, what's really important. And so that's something that made, made it very clear that for artists, that's not a problem because we always have an inner, inner life. But for a lot of people, um, not to be facetious, but it's really like all they can do is shop. Shopping is what their lives are about. And that's, that's, you know, that may seem slight, but in, in reality, that's what this whole um, consumerist world is about, is to keep us all from engaging with our inner selves and to be, to be external all the time. Um, so I can't make theater, uh, in, in a theater anymore at this point, but I but because my roots were in the visual arts and in film, and it's not a huge transition for me to move into doing something for um, a visual medium. And uh, so when when my office said, well, we can't do our project uh, Nocturne to 2020 we will do Nocturne Remix 2020 as a, a, a media event. So when that happened, um, in, a, in a strange way, because I haven't, I have mostly been working in the theater in the last 48 years. And only every now and then when I've had the good fortune of uh, being invited to do other kinds of art forms, which I've been lucky to have had those opportunities, this one was one that connected me to my origins because I, I, I studied visual arts and I graduated in filmmaking. And that's, and right after I graduated in filmmaking, I had the good, good fortune to meet Meredith. And that's what led me into the, the theater. But my roots were in film and visual arts. So when this opportunity came up, to make um, something for the medium of, of uh, a visual medium, it, it was returning, it was like returning to my roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, you, you created, or we will see it at the end of the talk. Um, um, is, it, is it a completely new work you did? Yes. Yeah, I was, it was specifically made to uh, address the, the pandemic. 
and it and it was um, it was a project that was was um, um, began just before the protests started to happen. Now, if the if the protests had happened earlier, it probably would have been a slightly different. It could have been a whole different um, result. But this predated the actual protests. And from my window, I have one image in in the video that's from my window of the protests going by on their way to um, the city hall, because this is part of the route from which that would happen. You know. Yeah, so we will see a meditation on, on the moment. <clears throat> what does that moment mean for you, the Black Lives Matter moment? Well, that moment is just a continuation of my work on Black Lives Matter. I've been, I've been doing um, uh, Black Lives Matter related work since 20, well, before that, but, but really strictly um, focused on that since 2013 when um, I was invited to the University of Maryland to create um, anything I wanted. And this was at the time, around the time of Trayvon, Mar Trayvon Martin's killing. Yeah. And I said to them, I said, I wanna do something about Trayvon Martin. So this was in 2013 and it was with university students. It was not with professionals, but with university students. And um, I invited my friend Talvin Wilkes, who's a theater director playwright, yep. to join me. We've we've have a very long uh, working history. Uh, if I could get it straight, since 1994. Um, so I invited Talvin to come on board on that, and created a work which started with Trayvon's shooting, um, and ends with the naming of, uh, visually, the naming of people who were lynched in, the, in American history and people who were sh unarmed and shot by the police at the end of the show. So, and the, the show is a kind of, um, from my point of view, a um, observation of, um, because I started with Trayvon in the show, and we, what we did was move back and forth in time. The show was like a time machine. Yeah, you called it kaleidoscope, right? Adventures in pre and post uh, uh, racial or pre and post racism in America. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. And this was still during uh, Obama's um, presidency when we started. So um, I, I wanted to look at American history after, so the show opens with Trayvon, but then it moves back and forth in time, mostly with real historical events. 90, I would say um, 80% of it or 85% of it was all factual material. And the one uh, section in it uh, was, was um, an adaptation of a Richard Wright short story, um, which was basically about the archetype of the rape of black women in America. So although that was the one piece in the show that was fiction, that reality is not fiction at all. Mm -hmm. So, but everything else was was factual in the show. Um, and, in, and we have since, um, that was 213. We were then invited to um, UMass in Amherst. Uh, is it Amherst? Yes, I think it's yep. yeah. Um, UMass and Amherst to do a uh, new kaleidoscope, and then we I went to Wake Forest uh, in um, Winston Salem to do yet another version of kaleidoscope with Talvin, and then um, the last one was this past uh, 2019 at uh, of all places the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, hmm. you know. Little did I know what was to come in Minneapolis af uh, from that point, you know, even though I've, I've spent a lot of time in Minneapolis and fully aware that it wasn't the, the, the liberal uh, relaxed place that, that its image projects. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things with, with Kaleidoscope was that Calvin and I would, would um, write um, material for the show from historical sources. And 
with each production, maybe he would take the lead. And, and what, what, what's unusual about it is that every state that we did the show in, we would find material from that state to slug in and slug something else out because it was not a linear story. We could do that. We could because it moves back and forth in time. So Talvin would sometime take the lead with that, like in Minneapolis, he uh, wrote all the new scenes. Some of the scenes in Kaleidoscope are consistent in all of the shows. The Trayvon opening, um, the, the petition of slaves and free blacks just before the American Revolution, that's always in the show. Um, Paul Robeson's um, encounter with the House of uh, um, un, un American Activities is always in the show. Um, we also um, have a, a very long section, a monologue um, that we um, adapted from James from a James Baldwin lecture um, that is also always in the show. But mm -hmm. inside the show, there are also and, and the Richard Wright story is always in the show. So that gives us some room to include material specifically from that local area in each show. That's what, that's what unique is unique about that show. So it's like that great art form of the 20th century, the idea of the collage that you can- Yeah, but and the, and the idea of it was, was that I wanted to, uh, to use factual materials so that the American audience would understand that uh, where the where why why uh, why the cause and effect that that makes it possible for Trayvon's killing still. So mm. the show is a series of to me evidence, historical evidence that that leads up to and continues this horrible um, nightmare of race in America. Did the show work? Did, yes. Did, so how did people respond? It was very, very, very successful. Um, and, and for me, what's valuable about that project was I'm going into the university, I'm working with young people, white, black. And one of the things we did was we cross, uh, cross color cast, we cross gender cast in that show. Like we have a long section in the show that's also always in the show uh, on the eve of the civil war. Um, on the eve of Lincoln's election. And the whole scene takes place in a ball in one of the plantation homes in um, Charleston, South Carolina. And the cast, which is so everybody at, in that scene is at this ball, which is the elite slave owners. If not the elite slave owners, then they're, they're, uh, then, uh, they're the ecology of, that, of the slave owners. But we cast it, um, we totally colorblind cast it that so that it forces the audience to look at the arguments for, uh, for slavery in that situation uh, differently. Because if, if you have a black actor playing a reverend who is against, uh, who is pro-slavery, it just makes you look at it differently. So the whole idea of that show, and then the whole show is seen from the lens of an alien species that's trying to understand what this racial uh, history is about. So it's kind of a science fiction work that way, but it's all to objectify this history so that the audience could see it like a specimen in a zoo. Incredible. Maybe also an idea to put it together in these days now as a, as a film work and to keep it on as a ongoing montage of, um, of, um, of a work. My, that, my that, would be, that would be wonderful, except that there's some, because I, the, there are advantages to doing a show at a university and disadvantages of doing a show at a university with students, which is you can have as many bodies as you want because yeah. they don't cost anything, you know. Well, maybe you'll find a way with Zoom and you reinvent it and you go around the copyright. Uh, who knows? I, I think it would be important um, document. How was it for you, I would like to ask, when you studied film, when you started out, you also are a non-white immigrant, an artist, who tried to make it in one of the toughest places. How, how, did, how was that for you when you started out and you didn't know where you were going? How was that time? Well, I'm a first-generation immigrant, 
My parents did not speak English. Uh, I grew up in Chinatown. Um, my world was very um, closed, not necessarily by choice, as we know in America, the Chinese lived in a ghetto because they were forced into a ghetto. You know, this what I grew up. Yeah, I think what I think you... the thing that people don't know about New York is just how racist New York what was and is, you know, uh, very different back then in that it was more more overt in a sense than it is today. It's more- Tell uh, us about it. That's a bit about it. Well, just that people, people wouldn't think, I mean, uh, non-Chinese people wouldn't think anything of saying something derogatory openly, you know, um, back then because there wasn't this kind of liberal veneer over things, you know, and 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 as a child, I wasn't aware um, of the boundaries, but but partly I wasn't aware of the boundaries because I never left those boundaries. I stayed in one place. I stayed in Chinatown, uh, and and when we did leave Chinatown, it would only be as a tourist. I would, you know, we would go to Times Square, or we would go to the Radio City Music Hall or we would would go take the Staten Island Ferry or something or go to Coney Island. That was that was growing up. That was the extent of my reality um, until I went to high school, because in Chinatown, the public school at that time in Chinatown was 99 percent Chinese. So there may have been one white student. There were there was in my class, if I remember in the sixth grade, there was one white student and one uh, white student who who was, I think, either an adopted child of an interracial marriage, you know. And then I remember also there was a an Italian immigrant girl who couldn't speak English, who was there very temporarily. Um, she, they took her out very soon, uh, her family or whoever took her out very soon because she, she was in the sea of Chinese faces and she was totally other and, and could not relate at all, you know, so totally understand why she would leave in that situation. Um, and then as, as I moved up in my education, so elementary school was in Chinatown, junior high school was in Little Italy, which means that half, half the class was Italian and half the class was Chinese. And the one who was neither of those had a problem because they were the outsider, you know. Uh, and the Chinese and Italians lived side by side in a kind of um, how do you describe it? A kind of um, you live uh, let live and let live kind of situation. They didn't have a lot to do with each other, although there was some overlap in that. Um, growing up on the street I grew up on, there, this pharmacist was Italian. There, at the beginning, when I was, at the very beginning of when I was growing up, there was also an Italian grocery store on my street, but it had started to be predominantly Chinese. And so the, the, the makeup of the street was mostly Chinese with uh, the, the Italian pharmacy, the little uh, Italian greengrocer, and um, secondhand Jewish clothing stores. That was that was kind of the makeup of Chinatown. Um, my 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 parents had a little cafe in Chinatown, and his landlady, my father's landlady, was a former Ziegfeld Follies girl, and she was Irish. Um, the thing that's interesting is that when I finally left Chinatown to go to school in high school, I went to an art high school. It's called the High School of Art and Design on 57th Street in Sutton Place. Now, you can imagine going from Chinatown to Sutton Place is a small town boy leaving yep. to the big city, you know. And uh, so that was that was eye opening. That was a totally eye opening experience on so many levels. For me to, I was, I had also considered going to the high school of uh, music and art, which at that time was on 92nd Street, somewhere uptown. It's now, I think, LaGuardia Performing Arts High School, I think it is. 
But the High School of Art and Design was on 57th Street in Sutton Place. Uh, the High School of um, Music and Art was on 90 something Street. And this gives you a kind of interesting um, reality uh, of, of my reality, which is that I thought I didn't try out for the High School of Music and Art because the High School of Art and Design where I went was far enough away from where I grew up. It was to go to 92nd Street seemed like too far away. You know, and and so it was in the high school of art and design where I actually first uh, encountered uh, more uh, white people and more pe people who were not Chinese, obviously, because in fact, when I entered the high school of art and design, which was a school of 500 students, I was the only Chinese student, Asian student, the first year of my, my first year there. Um, there were a few black students. There were some. Um, Puerto Rican students, the rest were mostly white. And so that was like culture shock. Uh, you know, I mean, I didn't even know how to relate to any, any of this at first. And as time went on, I had three friends. This shows you how um, insulated I was growing up in Chinatown. The, I, I did have a white friend in junior high school. He was my first white friend and he was an outsider. He was not Italian, obviously not Chinese. He was Welsh American. Um, so he was actually my first white friend. But then when I went to high school, my three white friends, I, I did not know at that time that the name, the, the three friends were Harry Novak, Barry Eisenberg and Larry Galligan. I did not know what their ethnicity was. I didn't know. I didn't know that uh, Harry Novak was Polish, Larry Galligan was Irish, and Barry Eisenberg was Jewish. Those distinctions didn't exist for me yet. I knew what an Italian kid was, but that was about the extent of it, you know. So, so that was the beginning of entering a world I didn't know, cultural, a cultural world I didn't know. And for some reason during those high school years, I didn't have um, such a huge sense of alienation. That didn't happen until I went to Pratt Institute when I started to um, meet kids who were more from the suburbs because Pratt at that time, there were a lot of students from Long Island and Westchester and places like that. And that's when I started to feel um, estranged. So, Leaving Chinatown through those years was this experience of increasing estrangement, increasing estrangement um, for me. So the, the sense of seeing the world with, with, um, in an anthropological way was kind of built in for me, that that has been um, deeply influential to the way I see the world. I mean, so it's not surprising the kaleidoscope takes the view of an alien looking at this race problem, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's very much um, fundamental to, to the way much of my work uh, uh, sees, much of, much of the way I see things. I think mm -hmm. this, this, the video that people will see today also uh, is clearly about that as well. When did you decide, what was the moment when you said, I'm going to be an artist, I'm going to make art, and why? Well, my, my you know, I, I, I come from a Chinese opera family. I'm, I'm a third generation director and creator. My grandfather was a, a director librettist in the Chinese opera. I never met him. Um, my father was a director librettist. My mother was a Chinese opera singer. Uh, our uncles were all involved in the theater in uh, whether backstage, mostly backstage for in one function or another. Uh, I grew up um, um, I grew up seeing Chinese opera in Chinatown whenever the troops came through town. And we always had uh, front row seats because we knew my father knew all these people, you know, who came through. 
Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to go into the theater. I had no, no interest in going into theater. At, at, even as a child, I was very drawn to, to performance without really understanding that that was going to be my fate. I also wrote during my early years in junior high school. In fact, uh, a teacher in my English class said, you're going to be a writer. Um, so I was, I was uh, and then my father's closest friend was the scenic drop painter for the Chinese opera. So he would give me art books. He would give me not Chinese art books. He gave me uh, a book on uh, Gray's Anatomy, which was a very well-known anatomy book. Uh, he gave me a book of Hiroshige, the, Jap the great Japanese woodcut artist, things mm -hmm. like that, you know, a book of Renaissance paintings. Um, <clears throat> and that's when I got drawn to visual arts. And during my public school years, I was not a great student. I was not a very um, conscientious student, but I knew I could draw. So I tried to get away with as much as I could just being an artist in school. And so for those first years, and so by the junior high school year, then it was like, well, are you going to high school? Which high school? And, and I chose the high school of art and design. So the progression of being a visual person was always there. And even as um, um, even in my junior high school years, I did illustrated um, comic books. So I was already creating worlds um, uh, on com in comic books. I remember seeing uh, years ago a documentary about um, Martin Scorsese and Mar uh, with interviews with his parents, and he did that. He no. did com comic mm -hmm. books like that. So this idea of creating worlds was something um, that was there from, from very early on. So high school, then I went to Pratt Institute, and from Pratt Institute, I moved on to the School of Visual Arts to, to graduate in filmmaking. And during that whole time through high school, I was always um, um, a fan of film. And at the beginning, it was all Hollywood movies, you know, and I would spend uh, a summer seeing 30 films. I would go, I would see four films in a day um, until they threw me out. Because back in those days, if you're a, you're a kid underage, there were matrons in the theater to make sure you left by five o'clock in the evening, you know. But anyway, so, and I was the high school uh, for, for one year, I think, or two years, I was the high school film critic for my high school paper. So it was, film was, so that the through line is visual arts and film was always there. And then theater subliminal, subliminally was always part of my back, back of my consciousness. And when I graduated from the School of Visual Arts, I met up with Meredith Monk. I, I decided I had heard of her. She had just done a big project at the Guggenheim. And I, and I was curious about her. And, but I, when I graduated from film school, I actually was at a moment where I wasn't sure what to do because this was 1969. Um, the civil rights era had, had just um, you know, completed. And I and I went well. Well, there's no, there's no, there's no. I don't have any role models uh, to make films as an Asian uh, uh, young Asian artist. But I, I saw Meredith's thing, and I said, "Well, I'm a, and a, 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 a student friend said I'm taking a class with Meredith Monk. Do you want to come?" I said, "Okay." I would never have done that without her. I would I would have been too shy. But mm -hmm. but I went with her to take this class. And at the end of the class, Meredith said, um, you're a good mover. I don't know what she was talking about. You know, I had no idea what she was talking about. And she said, you're a good mover. Come to my workshop, my private workshop. And I said, sure. And then I never went. It didn't go. But I happened to live about three blocks from where her, work, her loft was, where her studio was. And one day, in. and one day on Houston, on the corner of Houston and Broadway, I ran into her and she said, why didn't you come to my workshop? And I kind of mumbled some excuse. And she said, I have a class tonight, come. 
And um, I walked around the block four times before I had enough courage to, to go up into that loft. And that's what that changed my life completely. Incredible. Didn't also Bob Wilson go to Pratt Institute? Yes. So what, did, and, and my classmate, happened? my painting classmate, the easel next to me was Robert Maplethorpe. And Patty Smith was there too, but I didn't know Patty. Yeah. yeah they lived in I knew Patty. Robert, but not Patty. Yeah. So, you know, and then, and then New York back in those days uh, when I was going to school as, as people, uh, people don't real don't know so much, but you know, the rents, it, New York was bankrupt in the seventies. It was, it was a totally depressed place. And uh, so you could rent a place for a nickel, you know, the most, I, I don't think I ever paid a rent higher than $85 a month back then. Mm -hmm. And, but I also lucked out in that um, I, when I, after I met Meredith, I met uh, people who knew Meredith and, and worked, uh, worked with Meredith. There was um, the choreographer of, uh, at the time who was well-known choreographer named Daniel Nagrin. And his, his ex-wife was Lee Nagrin, who was, uh, who was a visual artist and performance artist herself. She was involved with Meredith as well. And uh, she uh, subletted a basement for me to live in in 1972, I think it was 73, 72. And I lived in this basement for the next 10 years on Bleecker Street, um, well, just off the Bowery for $50 a month. And the electricity and gas were all illegal. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a little warren of artists on that street. Philip Glass was across the street. Robert Frank was down the street, the Yippies, were there born again Christians had a group uh, a loft there it was it was a very uh, diverse street of artists and and very depressed looking area you know but those 10 years was when I was um, first started working with Meredith that was the 70s and uh, in 79 I left her company to form my own uh, company so the, the, the years with Meredith were from um, 71 or 72, 71, I think, 71 through 78. I was, I was a, a member of her company and I co-created three works with her as well, four works total. But, um, but I left the company in 79 to um, dive into the water and see if I could make it on my own. But Almost as soon as I met Meredith in 72, I started collaborating with her already. I started making work with her already. And I also simultaneously started making my own work in 72. Mm -hmm. So my very first work was in 1972. And my very earliest work already had media in it because yeah. um, I came from film, you know? And I came from film, I came from photography. So the idea of using sound and using projection um, and because of my visual arts background, all of those things seemed totally normal to me. It didn't seem odd to me to use all those elements. Yeah. Um, in, in the, and when I was going to high school in the high school of art and design on, uh, on 57th street, the gallery scene was all on 57th street. There was no Chelsea, there was no, uh, Tribeca or any of those things. It was 57th Street. That's where all the big art galleries were. And it was on, it was during that time, the Art Students League, which is where you did figure drawing, you could go do figure drawing, was on 57th Street. And so I did do that, but I also explored 57th Street and the gallery scene. And the gallery scene at that time, um, the, 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 progress, the progressive gallery at that time was uh, Sid, the Sydney Janice Gallery. And, and I went up there and I went to see two works. One was uh, a Rauschenberg installation and a Robert Whitman uh, installation. And the thing you have to realize is that it was the visual arts that started the use of media. They were the first ones. Then the dance world came next that used media. You know, Meredith was a pioneer of the use of media in dance, you know, 
in the late 60s. And, and actually, she, one can see you in the quarry. She restored that beautiful work. Yeah. And you were yeah. in there in the film and this groundbreaking, incredible work. Also so yeah. still to look at, yeah. But 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 you know her film sixteen millimeter sixteen millimeter earrings was really groundbreaking you know because it was a very much an interdisciplinary work you know but being an interdisciplinary artist for me was a natural because of my interest in so many different art forms it's the only art form that I have no uh, experience in is music I, I never studied music in any way so that that's the only area. But I, but I had, like I said, I'd studied visual arts and film and photography and studied dance with Meredith, you know, and I studied um, directing in film school. Hmm. In this time of Corona, as we say, the time where you said, I'm going I'm look back at the things I didn't do, like the unpacked boxes, you know, we all have in our apartments and we are looking now, um, what, why do you make art? What, what, are you thinking about it now more intensely? Is it, or is it a continuation? What, really, what is your motivation? Why do you do, why do you do it, what you do? You know, making art is a calling. You know, it's not, it's not a choice. That it's, it's who I am, you know, in, in the same way that someone who goes into um, the church to become a priest, it's a calling. It's not something that you choose. And um, so I just, and, and I just went in the direction that felt natural for me, which was making art. Now, the moment of knowing which art or what was the most comfortable for me, really, um, I mean, I was studying film, you know, and I, and I, I liked film and I was very, I mean, like as film is the art form that I love the most. But, um, but after going to film school, I went, well, I don't think you're, you're going, you know, and I was thinking in, in very um, more s traditional terms of filmmaking, of, of making, you know, story films. But I also uh, was exposed to the new wave, the French new wave and the great international cinema of the, of the mm -hmm. 70s. You know, that was, that was why I went to film school because of the great international cinema that New York had at that time, you know? Um, but I, but I went, I, I thought that's not really um, the right thing for me. So there was a moment before I met Meredith where I was kind of not sure where I was gonna go. And it was that, it was meeting Meredith, Meredith that uh, led me to where I am now. So, and those things are, um, not intentional they have a serendipitous it just the doors just opened you know mm. so maybe tell us a bit about the projects you 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 didn't do the ones you would love to do but you didn't do what it's what are um, um there's so many i'm trying to think um well well I'll give you two examples. One, you know, I have a, 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 a series of works that I started in 92 that continues this is to this day, the Undesirable Elements series, which is a documentary theater series using real people telling their own stories. And I have, uh, you know, I have, um, I have a great love for the city of Hong Kong. Um, not, not so much because my family, my family is from Guangzhou, which Hong Kong was, is part of. Um, but Hong Kong is where I feel most at home in the world because it is both completely Cantonese, which is my roots, um, and it is completely cosmopolitan. Uh, it, it is a faster city than New York, if anyone can imagine, you know. It's a very fast city, but that's where I feel like the 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 two parts of me, the my my cultural roots, my Chinese cultural roots, and my Western roots, connect in that place. Um, I forget your question. You had asked me a specific question. No, no, no. In that time when you say 
we, we also, you know, co connected with the corona where we think about our lives, our works. And you said, I'm thinking about the things I haven't done. Oh, yeah. So, what is, so, what is, so and, how, and why, and what, what is now interesting to you again to look at? What did you find? What surprised you? I'm, I'm trying to think of all the projects, so many projects. Um, Well, one thing that I never got around to doing, and I'm not sure I'll get around to doing it now, is uh, I, I always wanted to do a complete shadow play that was just using shadow play. And uh, one of the earliest projects I was interested in thinking about doing was the Golem mm -hmm. as a shadow play mm -hmm. uh, of an imaginary uh Prague of another century you know obviously a very visual um undertaking um how how could i do this you know that was that was the very first project i thought of doing that i didn't get to do there are projects uh like uh one that i i don't think i'll get to do either which is um, about a notorious murder in Hawaii at the time when the United States was eyeballing Hawaii as a imperial catch, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what was striking about this murder was it was, um, it was a case in which a white woman claimed rape. And then... Um, they arrested four young uh, Hawaiians who were mixed. Some were pure Hawaiian, I think. Some were mixed race, some were Chinese. I forget exactly, but it was a mixed um, thing. And they got, and they, uh, I think they got off. And then the victim and her husband kidnapped one of them, murdered that person, and the, the American press was all over it as, you know, um, colored person rapes white woman, you know, that kind of thing. And what struck me about that that was interesting was this is in Hawaii, but this story is, is exactly what happened in the, in, in the US, you know, at the time. And it was interesting to see how the press um, went down on it, you know, in a very racist way. And I just thought that was really interesting to mm -hmm because it was totally the same kind of thing happening in Hawaii. And, and then it went to trial. And one of the fascinating things is Clarence Darrell um, was the lawyer for the white um, culprit. Um, now, Darrell at that time, I think it's Clarence Darrell. That was the, the, the monkey trial, right? Do you remember that? Yeah, anyway, so he he was broke. He had investments during the Depression. He lost money during the Depression, and he took this case. He normally took cases in the opposite direction, but he took this case, which was interesting to me also. The Darwinistic trial was this school yes. teacher yeah. who, said, who said, I want yeah. to teach Lucia. Yeah. But to anyway, so he took this trial for, for, with, for, for this white bigot. You know, which I thought was really interesting, and I don't, you know, I didn't, I haven't done any research on it, so I don't know what his. I'm, I'm guessing that because he was broke, he was going to take it, and maybe I'm guessing that that the evidence was all out there that they were going to be convicted, right? They did get convicted, but because the United States was about to take Hawaii, they they got off scot free. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the four people that were falsely accused of the murder was killed by, by them. But they got off because Hawaii was about to be taken by the United States. I just thought it was an interesting convergence of social justice, political, historical, which is, which is an area that I've always, you know, mm -hmm. always been interested in. And they're kind of a documentary, documentary. Yes, and yeah, and then I wanted to use Hula um, 
to tell some of this story as well, you know. Um, well, your company was called Fiji, or was supposed to be called perhaps Fiji, right? So it would have. Yeah, would have at, been, at the very beginning, my company yeah. was called the Fiji Company because my second show was called I Flew to Fiji, You Went South. Mm -hmm. And it was the first work that was ever reviewed. And Jonas Mikis wrote the review in the Village Voice, and he liked it. And I thought it was a good luck charm to call it the Fiji Company. But then everybody started to think we were a company from Fiji, which was a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah. And I said, never mind, forget about that, you know. But if you look back at your truly your 100 production, there's all the incredible amount of things you haven't done, but they're still on your mind. And this time right now. Do you think differently now about your work or are you is something changing as we call for the TAC, the time after Corona? Do you think you something changed? Did you are you picking up something in these uh, moments of confinement, of lockdown, of uh, uninterrupted thinking where you said you connect to the inner self? Well, well the thing that was a revelation for me. In, in as an artist in the coronavirus period is the reconnection with the media, pure media, making a work for, um, for the internet, not a theater work. Hmm. Um, and also that the work you're, you're gonna show today was made only, only by me and my editor, just the two of us. Whereas in theater, you know, it's a whole team of people. You have your, you know, a lot of people. And so it was going back to the essence of, of being an artist. And, and uh, I just, I just uh, and it was really satisfying to go back to a solo experience of making art. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't, I think it's going to be a long time before anything will happen in the theater. I don't know how the situation is going to change anytime soon. Um, but I'm quite happy to be doing media right now. And, and I'm already working on an adaptation of a stage work uh, that I made in 1996 um for media mm -hmm. um and and that work um was made uh about the return of hong kong to china at the time um and i made that work because i was talking to a friend's wife and this was 94 and uh, and she said why 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 is Ch uh, hong kong being returned to china why don't they let the British keep it? And I was shocked by, by what she said and realized that people had no idea what that story is about. Mm -hmm. No idea that Britain had, is, is, was the biggest drug dealers in the history of the world. Yeah. So, so I made that work then, which was not just about, um, not just about the return of Hong Kong, but about the West's relationship to China, back and forth in time again, uh, including uh, the first trade envoy in 1793 by Lord George McCartney, because the British were buying silks and teas and porcelain. Tea was like caviar back in those days. It was in only the rich could afford to drink tea. The servants would dry off the used tea leaves and resell them. This is back in the day. And, uh, but the Chinese did not want anything from, from the British. They only wanted silver. So the British had a, 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 a deficit and that they needed to uh, correct. And so they sent an envoy to China and they solved their problem later by, by um, uh, a, creating an addiction for opium with, by more than 50% of the Chinese people. So, so I wanted to do, and then, and then at that time, I, I wanted to do a show with that as the frame, the, the trade envoy to China, because um, McCartney wanted to open a trade port in China at that time. 
and wanted to meet the emperor to talk it over. Now, protocol in 1793 with the emperor was, with China anyway, was you don't come here without being invited. Mm. And the British arrived with 400 people, three ships, uninvited. But the Chinese knew that these were dangerous people and they had to humor them, blah, blah, blah. But, but to meet the emperor, there was protocol. And the protocol was nine kowtows. And McCart and so they met lower officials and lower officials told McCartney, there's nine kowtows involved if you're gonna meet the emperor. And McCartney balked at this. And uh, so that was the framing story of Chinoiserie, the show that I made in 96. And, but within that show, I also, it was a vessel for relationships between the West and China, including the building of the railroads by the Chinese pioneers. 90% um, of the railroad builders from California to Promontory Point, Utah were Chinese. Uh, and when the, and then the East Coast part was of course, Irish or well, European. But when the railroads met, and they were racing to see who would get to Promontory Point first. I don't remember who got there first, but when they got there, they did. Award, a big money uh, award. There was that yeah. big money award, whoever got there first. Yeah. yeah. So, then, so then when they got there, they took a commemorative photograph with the locomotive. And 90% and of, the, of the people who built the railroad from the California side, which was the dangerous side, where, which was like... 20,000 pounds of bones of Chinese railroad workers were shipped back to China after the building of the railroads, which show how many people died building that railroad. Especially and the yet, explosions, yeah, and the tunnels and the explosions. Yeah, yeah, and, and the whole term Chinaman's chance came from dropping the Chinese into um, the caverns with dynamite and pulling them up quickly, which they knew they weren't gonna survive that. Um, anyway, so the so the, the when the two um, when the east and west met at Promontory Point, they took a commemorative photograph and left the Chinese out. Ninety percent of the labor was left out of that photograph. So that tells you the American story. You know, typical American story, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and um, so that was another part of the story: the Opium Wars the uh, Chinese American pioneers and the murder of Vincent Chin was also who was, whose story is, um, you know, like, like um, the, um, the killing of Michael Brown or whatever, you know what I mean? It's, it's a typical story of police brutality, uh, not police brutality of, of racism in America. Anyway, so that was, that show is now being, I'm trying to rework that for media and inviting younger artists to join me on discrete sections of that narrative to redo as a media piece. So if anybody listens now, can they can connect you and- uh, Yes. You can, we should actually look at the film you did and okay. uh, talk about it. But before, how is your company doing? How is- We're how hanging is, in there. What, what, do you, what do you project for the future? What's, are you getting support? Is New York City helping? Is it, are you having the, the board? What's happening? Um, we did get some help from, from foundations. We did get uh, some help from the relief fund or whatever that thing is called, you know, we did get some help, but it's all temporary, you know, um, and the future remains unclear. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen next. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a crap shoot, as they say, we're still waiting you know, we're, 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 we're ready to um, do whatever needs to be done, but, but we don't know uh, what, the, what's, what the situation is yet. And until that clarifies itself, it's very hard to tell. So your company, is it in danger? You think it will survive? Is it, is it well, I think every company is in danger at this point, you know? Um, there's no telling, there's just no telling. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. for, for our listeners, a company that really works since 1975 has done such significant work is uh, is endangered and, uh, and is, is struggling for survival. And nobody knows 
where it will end, but uh, Ping Chong and his company, of course, are continuing their work and connecting into the outside world. We're gonna um, look at the, uh, the work which uh, we're gonna ask uh, Christina uh, to, uh, to um, connect it. Christina Washavskaya, who also was the editor, if I understand right, right? You yes. both work together. So uh, Christina, maybe you can show us, it's about six minutes, how long is it? Uh, six yes. and a half minutes, yeah. Yes. Christina, yeah? Yes. And um, and so um, this is a film, a meditation you did during Corona time in your apartment in New York, and you communicate via Zoom or phone or text or whatever. We edit it uh, remotely, online together. You you edit it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's have a look. Great. Here we go. Oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. But they will teach us that eternity is the standing still of the present time, a nook stands, as the schools call it, which neither they nor any else understand, no more than they would a hick stands for an infinite greatness of place. In Jorge Luis Borges' short story, The Aleph, the Aleph is a stand-in for infinity, a point that encompasses all other points in space, a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Borges' protagonist, also named Borges, peers into the darkness of a gloom-laden cellar and encounters the mythical Aleph. He says, I saw a small iridescent sphere of almost unbearable brilliance. At first, I thought it was revolving. Then I realized that this movement was an illusion created by the dizzying world it bound. The Aleph's diameter was probably little more than an inch, but all space was there, actual and undiminished. Each thing, a mirror's face, let us say, was infinite things, since I distinctly saw it from every angle of the universe. I saw the teeming sea. I saw daybreak and nightfall. I saw the multitudes of America. I saw a silvery cobweb in the center of a black pyramid. I saw a splintered labyrinth. It was London. I saw close up, unending eyes watching themselves in me as in a mirror. I saw all the mirrors on earth and none of them reflected me. I saw in a backyard of Soler Street, the same tiles that 30 years before I'd seen in the entrance of a house in Fraibentos. I saw bunches of grapes, snow, tobacco, loads of metal, steam. I saw convex equatorial deserts and each one of their grains of sand. What my eyes beheld was simultaneous, but what I shall now write will be successive because language is successive. In 1790, on the eve of Carnival, an impetuous 27-year-old French aristocrat named Xavier de Mestre fought an illegal duel in Turin. De Mestre survived unscathed from the encounter, but there's no record of the damage he did to his rival. As punishment for committing an illegal act, he was placed under house arrest for 42 days, well, along with his manservant, Joannetti, and his dog, Rosine, and was forbidden to leave. Of his house arrest, de Mestre had this to say. Oh, was it thus to punish me that they confined me to my room? One might as well exile a mouse to a granary. Like a precocious teenager blogging in lockdown, de Mestre amused himself by writing a travel journal, a send-up of the Grand Tour. Voyage autour de ma chambre. Voyage around my room. He writes, They may have forbidden me to travel through a city, one place, but they left me the entire universe. Infinity and eternity are at my command. While wearing his travel outfit, a pair of pink and blue pajamas, de Mestre takes us on a tour of his room and his inquisitive mind. His account is wildly digressive with a touch of insanity. 
He playfully curates the minutiae of his environment as if they were momentous historical artifacts as worthy as the pyramids of Egypt. As he circumnavigates his room, situated at 45 degrees latitude, running from east to west, consisting of 36 paces, if you hug the walls, that is, the cloistered count turns into something Borges would have recognized from his own encounters with silence. A kind of aleph, however unworthy, a door to the infinite. Sometime after 1792, Count de Xavier de Mestre chose self-exile in Russia rather than lose his head to the French Revolutionary Army as it swallowed Turin and its environs. In 1799, he began to write the sequel, Expedition Nocturne Autour de ma Chambre, Night Voyage Around My Room. It took him 22 years to complete it, this time his travels reached the outer limits of his St. Petersburg room, the window ledge. Demestre died in 1852 at the age of 89. He outlived both his family and his century, but not Voyage Autour de ma Chambre and its sequel. Yeah, Christina, maybe you join us for a moment if you can. I'm not sure if it's technical possible. Um, oh, I'm yeah, here. Awesome. Hello. Congratulations. So this is a journey around the room of Ping Chong or both your rooms or? One room. One room. So it's the infinite in, in, in the space where you are and the, in, the inside. So it's a, a, a corona work and, you know, one of the first, I guess, in the coming out, coming out of a... Uh, uh, the uh, downtown or the borders of uh, Chinatown and Brooklyn. So what, what did, what did, did you learn something when you, while you both were making it in confinement? Was there something different? Well, as, I, as I said, it was, it was the joy of making art by myself again, you know, not, not dependent on somebody else really, you know. Mm. Um, but it was really fun to have just one collaborator, which was Christina, yeah. you know. So that was really fun just having that one other person. I like to, you know, I have uh, my poet friend, uh, Jim Moore, who lives in Minnesota. I always feel jealous of him because I said, you can write about the coffee you're drinking that morning and that's your poem. I can't do that in a theater work. I can't get that minute about anything, you know, because theater is just too expensive to do that, yeah. uh, not to mention anything else. but. So this was uh, an intimacy that I miss um, making theater because, yeah. because theater is not so much about that, you know? Yeah. And the poet can even write about, when, if he can't write or she, you know, they can even write about that, which yeah. is possible to do if you are. Uh, yeah. Christina, so, how was that for you? Um, I have worked with Ping in the past. This was our first time collaborating more on a film. I have you know, prepared slides uh, for paying and kind of done that kind of work. But this was a little different because this was combination of voiceovers and Ping's videos and, and images being put together. And um, and then being able to see each other 
was it wasn't super difficult because we shared everything and dropped everything into a drive and had conversations back and forth and I would send him revised versions of it and he will tell me okay tweak this or tweak that and um, that kind of developed this whole project into what you are seeing but um, I don't know it was it was not actually it wasn't difficult at all it was um, it's always great to work with Ping and uh, this was just like a different level of working together uh, at our own little stations, but yet uh, on this one project. Well, I, I also like that that Christina brought some of her own creativity into some of that because, um, and I'm glad she did that because when I collaborate with people, I might throw the concept out to, to what it what I want, but I really like people to bring something to the table, you know, and uh, and she did, and she surprised me with some things, you know, which which I really I love that when that happens. And you yes, haven't seen each other for two or three months, right? And uh, I'm sorry, you haven't seen each other for a long time. Then. Yeah, we like, see we see each other every uh, every Tuesday because we Zoom. have a company meeting every Tuesday on the on Zoom. Yes, on Zoom. Yeah. On Zoom. In person, when did you meet last time? Uh, March. Mid March, yeah. yeah, that was the last time that we actually seen each other in yeah, the office. Yeah. yeah, but since right. then, been working away at our computers at home. So over three and a half months or four months, two company members haven't seen each other, but created something. You really thank you both uh, um, for 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 joining us and for uh, participating. Thanks to Bruce uh, for helping us also uh, to connect, and I think it gave us an insight and into one of the artists that made New York's theater what it is, but also, you know, how you think about Corona and that it's so different as an experience, but this is everyone in the experience individually and also to present a bit of a work um, that in a way, as you said, reconnected you with your very, very beginning and, uh, and into that inner world where everything started from. And yeah, and you're wonderful to hear about the, how Meredith Monk has seen you, said you come tonight to my I'm show. looking forward to to, to yeah. seeing some of your other interviews. Yeah, she came. She had a wonderful contribution, also. But uh, you know, also that just shows how how mysteriously the universe is connected, and how mysteriously our lives develop, and how what what happens. So, um, thank you both for joining us, and uh, and uh, we will go on uh, this week um, with our journey around the uh, around the world. But we focus a bit on New York because we feel this all. There's American cases time again to, to focus on this. Tomorrow we have someone from Germany, Susanne Kennedy, young, truly significant artist, um, in a way also a visual artist, someone who kind of staged what people haven't seen before. I have never seen before. I saw her ultra world as being inside really um, a VR world, uh, an alien world also one could say, a world that is constructed differently, uses text differently and is no longer directly connected perhaps even in a way to the narratives we know from our theater worlds but she is creating something that it connects to a post uh, post traumatic thinking and we uh, are really um, interested to to hear from her and um, her philosophy about the work so i think they're really significant artists on wednesday we have the great lee brewer and maud mitchell um, of the significant company of uh, the Mabu Minds, who has been so influential, so um, important, and created such beautiful works, who are now are more rather likely to be working at the Comédie Française than getting a bigger theater in New York to do their work. And uh, we really also thrilled to have them uh, with us. A significant artist from Portugal, Tiago Rodriguez. If it all works out, uh, um, he will be with us um, on uh, Thursday, a significant uh, uh, a voice in European theater. He did this great play about the prompter that was uh, really so important, the Avignon Festival some time ago, but also many, many other works. And Caridad Switch will tell us on Friday about how the Latinx world is experiencing this moment, what it means for her community um, and, uh, and um, everybody. And upcoming will be the tap dance world with Tony Bach and Jacques Rancière, a French philosopher, will join up as all works out the week after and many, many others. So um, thank you for listening. Thanks for HowlRound uh, for hosting us again, Travis and, uh, and Thea and Vijay, Andy and Sanyang from the Siegel team. And to, of course, to you listeners for taking time out again. I know we are asking a lot. This is week 16. We 
can't believe it, but I think it has been an important contribution what these artists have made uh, to, to give some meaning, to understand better, and also to know we are not alone, and also to know that art matters, art counts, it is significant. As we can see from Ping Chong's work, it has been always on the right side of social justice and the struggle for the history, for the freedom and liberties. And, um, and I think uh, this is important now. And also the time when he said when New York City was doing so poorly when he started creating his work, there are, of course, um, parallels to New York City who we do not know that will return to the one we know, how long it will take, five, 10 years of ever, and um, who will survive businesses, companies, nonprofits. It's uh, up in the air, as uh, Ping Chong said, but I think we all hope and, and, uh, and uh, I, believe that art will be part of that uh, reconstruction of the city. It is a great, great city. It has gone through so much in its hundreds of years of history. And I think it will also come out perhaps stronger and in a better way because all the greed and the capitalism, as Ping Chong said in the beginning, the neoliberal one has not been good for people living here, not for the artists, not for the people. So thank you all. And uh, I hope uh, you will join us again. Stay safe, do wear a mask and stay tuned to us. Thank you, thank you both, bye-bye.